So let's talk a little bit about your relationships. Um, you've been in a relationship for over 25 years with your partner and you guys have a dominant submissive relationship. Can you talk a little bit about how that works for you? And did you enter into the relationship with those roles or did that evolve over time? Okay. Um, so just to be specific, I have a poly partner of 30 plus years, a, okay. a partner of 26 years, a, two partners of 15 years. I just stepped out of a, pro, a relationship of 15 years and have another one of four years, right? Wow. <laughs> You're busy. Yeah. <laughs> I hired to retire. That's what I like to say. <laughs> it comes with a great pension plan. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but my, my par partner of 26 years is a person that most people are familiar with. Her name is Indigo Black. She's been in my life pretty much my entire adult life. And, um, and yeah, we've been, inseparable since our meeting. And no, I didn't come into this from a poly space. What I did was I had a partner who is still here. Um, she was my high school sweetheart. Uh, she was the person who left and came back and introduced me to King. Right, right. And, okay. um, and I met Indigo and I was like, I want you both, you know, and both of them decided to stay. And so for me, mm -hmm. it was a wonderful opportunity to be with two women that I've loved, you know, uh, pretty much my entire existence, you know, mm -hmm. and that's where it started. And we thought we were the only people. We felt like we were shipwrecked on an island uh, because nobody could really understand uh, who we were, what we were creating, the feelings that we um, had cultivated over time. And so, we took on the challenges of being a black B poly <laughs> raising five kids, three people raising five kids together. And, um, in, in, a, in a neighborhood that wasn't really reflective of those lifestyle choices. And we just mm. chose to stick by our guns and become life partners. And we have ever since. How do you, so, how do you specific, what are the most important aspects I should say that you feel have made your relationship successful? Really a couple of different philosophies. I, I really believe in prime directives. And so if any of your uh, audience are nerds like me, <laughs> you'll know that comes from uh, Star Trek, but kind of these prime directives that are put in place and just are kind of the presiding outline for how we move through the world and that's always do us in the best interest of the family right it's really easy for the person who's the oddball like me uh, it's, it's one male and multiple females in this um in this dynamic it's really easy for me to start getting a big head for me to be like oh do this do that because i'm the dom and because i quote unquote have the most power in the relationship. But for me, I always default to what's in the best interest of the family. Even if it's counter to what I want, I try to always do this in the best interest of the family. Hmm. Um, the other, uh, number two is really love each other as I have loved you. I have to remember that I set the pace and the tone and the cadence for how other people interact. They'll never, um, they'll never do it without an example. I have to show people how I care for my wife so that they can love them at least a fraction of how much I love her. They have to mm -hmm. show, I have to show my wife how much I, I love our girlfriend so she can love her at least a fraction, if nothing else, a fraction of how much I love that person. So I always have to remind myself that I'm leading by example. And really the last thing is if something breaks, fix it, right? The, it's not about who broke it. It's about what are we going to do to fix it? You know, I can sit here and point fingers all day and try and force people to take responsibility or, or to make somebody wrong or feel bad or someone needs to prove themselves right. That's great. Okay. But how are we going to fix it? So I really put the onus on, let me hear what the issue is. And now let's figure out the best way to go about making this right for you. Mm -hmm. And after you know 26 years of group involvement right 
those are the less the three lessons that I can really say are the most pervasive. I would say that there's probably 12 in total, but those are the most three that got me as far as I am today. You said that you have um, all raised five children together. Has that proved challenging because you don't fit the like typical marital norms? Oh, yeah. um, like, does it come up at school at all? Or is there something that makes it, you know, because I, I think a lot about now it's because I moved in with my parents about a year ago to help take care of them. Yeah. I think a lot about the, you know, this Western culture idea of like, the husband and wife have to move away from their parents, live on their own. Nowadays, both work full time, raise children, you know, and we've moved away from the idea of like a community or a group of people, like, you know, being raised by a village, so they say. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that being in that kind of like group um, with your partners is helpful in raising your children? Absolutely. Are there drawbacks? Like, how does that work? Oh yeah, there's always gonna be pluses and minuses. And just to, just so we're on the same page, my kids are grown. They're go grown and gone. <laughs> my, our okay. youngest is 26, we have grandkids now, right? So, oh wow. <laughs> so we are, we are pretty much done. But when it was happening, and this is important to say was, this poly was still emerging as a thing. I remember seeing the first um, TV, conversation on MTV about Polly, which is where we learned the word from, but we'd already been doing it for about five years. So this kind of idea of Polly as it exists today and where, where it's more palatable, we were doing it where it was absolutely unacceptable. And so for me, it was essential to raise my kids in this way because my partners were able to give my children things that I couldn't. Right. I, I'm not great at math or academics, but our other partner that is no longer here, it, you know, has a master's degree and Ph.D. and really got our kids as far as they could go academically. They, I wouldn't have been able to provide them with that. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also tried to uh, give a healthy masculine archetype for my son and for the daughters. Right. We tried to be there. There was always someone to be at a recital or at a game or, you know, if two people are working, it's hard to look up in the stands and not see your parents there. Right. At least there was some representative of the unit to say, we're here to support you. Right. Yeah. To me, that is absolutely essential to a kid's development, especially as a kid who grew up playing football and never saw his parents up in the stands. Never saw his parents up in the bleachers, never at a away game, no one to drive you anywhere, you know? So for me, I never wanted my children to have to go through that. And it, at the time, it wasn't a conscious thought, but in hindsight, I got to give them the type of experience that we didn't. So yes, in this society, radical individuality, even as a couple becomes this, in, in, my, in my feeling, a kind of sick, kind of pervasive thing because we're not prioritizing the necessities of the children. And mm -hmm. I'm speaking from the framework of our society, not just the couple, but the society that says you should just be two people in a home working eight, not eight hours a day, commuting uh, two hours a day, and then coming home and giving your children whatever you have left, giving yeah. each other whatever you have left. Right. And then repeating that process and hoping for the best outcome, as opposed to stepping into a place of humility, creating a community and really sharing the experiences, the love, the responsibilities, but also the problems. You know, more hands make the work light. 